So hello everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. My name is Amy Consalvi and I'm the Director of Education and Visitor Services at the museum. And before we get started, I just have a couple notes. Um, first of all, this webinar is being recorded and it will be available on our website probably midweek. Um, we will be taking questions after the presentation, so please use the Q&A feature rather than, rather than the chat uh, to submit your questions at any point during the presentation. Our summer newsletter is coming out soon. It's in the hands of our copy editor right now as we speak. Um, and that will contain all of our upcoming programs, um, which will continue to take place over Zoom uh, for July, August, and September. Um, the newsletter will also have information regarding our reopening date, um, which I still can't release <laughs> just yet. Um, and it, it will also contain sort of all the protocols and things you need to know um, prior to visiting the museum once we do reopen. Um, and to sign up for that newsletter, you can just visit our website, museumofrussianicons.org. And finally, um, I will send everyone attending today an email uh, containing a program survey as well as information on how to sign up for that newsletter and information on how you can support the museum at this time. We're grateful for the donations that we've received over the past few months and thank you to everyone who has either donated or purchased a membership. Um, whether it's $5 or $500, every donation counts, every donation has an impact and um, on behalf of the staff and the board, we do thank you for that support um, during this time. Uh, so enough from me. I'm happy to introduce Dennis uh, Sardella, who's one of our docents at the museum. Um, if you ever have the opportunity to visit the museum and take one of his tours, I highly encourage you to. Uh, we're very lucky at the museum. We have fabulous docents, um, but Dennis really takes it to another level, in my opinion. So hopefully uh, we can resume the tours sometime this year, but we'll see. <laughs> it depends on how everything goes. Uh, so Dennis Sardella has been a docent at the museum since 2012, where he leads gallery tours and introduces visitors to the world of Russian icons. He also writes and speaks regularly to civic and church groups on the topics of religious icons and the role they play in Eastern Christian spirituality. From 1967 until 2012, he was a professor at Boston College. In 1990, he became the founding director of the Boston College Presidential Scholars Program, a university-wide co-curricular honors program, and directed it until 2010. For 17 years, he and his wife Marjorie, a fine art photographer, led groups, to Boston led groups of Boston College Presidential Scholars on month-long study trips to France. Dennis and Marjorie have continued to travel and photograph extensively throughout Western Europe. So I will turn it over to Dennis. I will mute myself. Thanks, Amy. When you uh, said I take it to a different level, I'm hoping sincerely that the level is up and not down today. Anyway, uh, sacred space and sacred time. Let me begin with a, a little personal information. My days usually begin by come downstairs, I make myself uh, three cups of really strong coffee, put it into a mug. I go out onto the porch next, uh, next to us, and I sit down and I greet the morning that way. Every other Sunday, uh, I'm greeting the morning along with a row of 10 cars parked across the street. They belong to a group of runners who've been running together for 12 years. These people are really devoted. They run in the sun, they run in the rain, they run in the snow, they run in blistering heat and bone chilling cold, they are really dedicated. And clearly for them, this time is sacrosanct. Today, they didn't run because they, were, they have a separate route on alternate weeks. And for me, my time with my coffee in the morning is my sacred time and my sacred space. It's the thing that helps me to get into the day. You probably have something similar uh, that's a sacred thing to you as well. And what I wanna talk about today is sacred space and sacred time in a slightly different way. But let's begin with some examples. First of all, sacred time and sacred space are places or times that are set apart because of the feeling that they evoke in us or because more importantly, they take us beyond ourselves. Here are a couple of examples. Um, this is the Vietnam Memorial in DC. I visited this many years ago with uh, actually a high school band. My wife and I were there. And the day we were visited, it was a really beautiful sunny day. The place was packed, but what struck me was how quiet it was. You could have heard a pin drop 
even though people were practically standing shoulder to shoulder, it was as if a kind of cone of silence had descended over every person, and they were, they were alone in that crowd with their own thoughts and their own memories. Second place is uh, Chartres Cathedral in France. <clears throat> On the floor of Chartres Cathedral, as in many uh, Western medieval cathedrals, is a labyrinth. It's a huge thing. Now, a labyrinth is not a maze. A maze has many different paths, and most of them lead nowhere. Only one goes to the correct place. Um, but a labyrinth is a single, has a single path that winds inexorably to the center. But it's arranged in such a way that you can't really judge by looking toward the center while you're walking it how close or how far you are. Labyrinths were used in the medieval times, and they're still used today, as kind of symbolic pilgrimages, the center representing heaven. So it's kind of like your trajectory um, toward heaven. And what people would typically do is to walk the labyrinth and stop at the various corners and say a prayer. My experience with the labyrinth was that I happened to be in Manhattan shortly after 9-11. And I found a labyrinth at a little church just outside the mouth of Wall Street. The place was, you know, Wall Street was just filled with people because it was right around the lunch hour. And I started to walk it anyway. Within a couple of minutes, I had completely lost any sense of time and the people around me. It really literally almost took me out of myself. And that's what a really good spiritual experience will do. That's what sacred space and sacred time are meant to do, to take us beyond ourselves. Question is, where are they taking us? Well, one Orthodox writer said, to enter an Orthodox church is not simply to enter a building, but to be invited in effect to enter into another dimension to move from the time and space of our daily lives into an encounter with the transformed and redeemed time of the heavenly kingdom. That's a little theological speak. So let's try to translate that into something more like English. In my previous life, I was a chemistry professor. And so when I would put an equation on the board, mindful of the fact that I had a lot of people who were not science majors, I would usually say, okay, let's see, what does this mean in English? So what does this statement really mean in ordinary English? Well, you can think of sacred space and sacred time as when the sacred intrudes into the human realm or when the human realm is sort of caught up into the sacred. The, the motion is always not from you to the sacred, but the sacred to you. Here's a classic example. This is Moses. <clears throat> Most of us know the story. Moses is in the desert and he's guarding his father-in-law's sheep. As he looks around, he spots a bush that seems to be burning. The strange thing about it is that it doesn't look like it's being consumed. So of course, moved by curiosity, he begins to walk over to it to see what's going on. As he gets a certain distance away from it, a voice speaks to him from the fire. It says, Moses, stop, come no further, take your shoes off. The place where you stand is sacred ground or holy ground. And Moses realizes that it's God speaking to him from the fire. So he listens <clears throat> and God says to him in not so many words, congratulations, Moses, you have been chosen as the Messiah to go to Pharaoh and bring the people of Israel out of Egypt where they've become enslaved and they've been for several hundred years. Well, despite some misgivings, Moses eventually goes to Pharaoh. The people of Israel leave Egypt. Moses takes them through the waters of the Red Sea and when they get on the other side, on the other bank, they're now free from the Egyptians' um, fists, and they're no longer slaves, they're free people. Then they spend the next 40 years wandering around in the desert. Now, it's interesting to ask the question, why was it that they wandered around in the desert for 40 years? Well, Metropolitan Anthony Bloom, one of my favorite writers, wrote an essay on the Lord's Prayer. And he says that the moment the Israelites reached the other shore of the Red Sea, they were, no, they were no longer slaves, but free. But while they left their chains behind them, their physical chains, they still carried with them the minds of slaves. Their minds were still enslaved. And it took 40 years of their wandering in the desert for them to grow into what it meant to be free. Well, early Christian writers said, that's a lot like what, uh, what we know. We come into the world we're enslaved by sin. We cry out to God to save us as the Israelites did. He sends us a redeemer, not Moses, but Christ. Christ brings us through the waters, not of the Red Sea, but of baptism 
And then when we get on the other side, we are now free. And then we spend the next 40 years of our lives stumbling around trying to figure out what that means. Well, let's go back a little further. Once Moses and the Israelites were in the desert, and God spoke to him, God gave him uh, instructions to build a tabernacle. Uh, it was obviously gonna be a mobile tabernacle since they were wanderers. But this is an artist's idea of what it might have looked like. And there are several things uh, to think about. First of all, there was a large uh, bronze altar. That's the altar of sacrifice. That's where the burnt offerings were made. Not far from it was a large basin of water for purification. And that was meant, first of all, not simply in purification, but to recall that when they went through the waters of the Red Sea, they were purified of the slavery and priests would wash that before they entered the holy place. Inside the holy place, which was divided into two parts, only priests were allowed to go, first of all, but secondly, there were three things in there. First of all, it was an altar of incense, uh, incense always figures prominently in the, in, in the Israelite worship and also in Orthodox worship. Uh, one of the Psalms has a line that says, may my prayers rise before you as an evening sacrifice like incense. There were also 12 loaves of bread on a table. Um, they were called the, the, uh, the bread of the presence. They represented the 12 tribes of Israel. And then there was a menorah with six, bran six branches and seven lamps that was kept burning perpetually. The inner part of the uh, tabernacle was the Holy of Holies. It was screened from the main part of the, uh, the temple by a, a, a large curtain, and it was only allowed for one person to enter it a year. That was the, holy, the high priest, and then only on the Day of Atonement. And inside there was the um, Ark of the Covenant containing the, um, the tablets of stone with the Ten Commandments on it. For those of you who may have seen the uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark movies, here's an artist's idea of what the tabernacle, might, the Ark of the Covenant, might have looked like. 400 years later, when Solomon built his great temple, he used the same basic plan. It was just a lot more elaborate in its decoration. But let's talk for a couple of minutes about Solomon's temple. The reason I'm, going, I'm doing this is because um, in, in the Russian... Oh, Orthodox tradition, the church is often called a temple, and it actually is a lineal descendant of the Israelite temple. So here's Solomon's temple. There was a much larger area, but I've kind of compacted uh, it for simplicity. There were two courts where only Israelites uh, could enter, only Jews. There was the court of the Israelites where only men could go, and then further out and surrounding it was the court of the women, but I've combined them, as I said, for uh, ease of space. So no Gentile, no non-Hebrew uh, no non could enter the temple. Uh, men and women who were not priests could go into the course of the Israelites. A little further in was a place where only the priests could go. And like uh, Moses' temple, Moses' tabernacle, um, there was a large altar for sacrifices. There was a large basin, a huge basin of water, uh, which was called the Sea of Bronze. It was an enormous basin that rested on the backs of uh, 12 carved oxen, representing the, uh, the 12 tribes of Israel. And then inside was the holy place. Further in was the Holy of Holies, where only the high priest could go. And again, the Holy of Holies was separated from the holy place by a veil. The Orthodox Church uses the same basic plan. And the Orthodox Church, as I mentioned, is often considered to be a temple. So here's a kind of generic Orthodox church, and let's go through and look at the different parts. The outermost part, corresponding to the uh, court of the Israelites and the court of the women, was the narthex. It's a gathering place. Only presumably baptized Christians or Christians in training technically were allowed in there. Further in was the nave, the place where the folks sit. The nave comes from the Latin word for uh, ship. So you can think of it as kind of the ship of Christ sailing through the troubled waters of life with um, all of the community as passengers. Beyond that was the apse, the equivalent of the Holy of Holies, where instead of the Ark of the Covenant, you would have found the tabernacle um, with the consecrated um, bread and wine, if there was any, um, and the altar where sacrifice takes place. 
between them in the place of the veil in the Israelite temple was the iconostasis, a standing wall of icons. By about the eighth century in the church, um, the, the apse and the nave were separated by a low wall called the templon. It was a low wall with, with columns on top of it with a bar across the top. Over the centuries in the Western church, uh, the bar and the columns were dispensed with and it became uh, what became the altar rail. In the Eastern church, they developed the tradition of putting up icons on the wall and that eventually developed into the iconostasis, which I'll talk more about a little bit later. And the last item I wanna mention is the dome. Okay, every Orthodox church has a dome. It's, it's an essential part of the church. Now, Byzantine churches, Orthodox churches are built around the central dome. <clears throat> it's essentially a hemisphere sitting on top of what looks like an open table with four legs. That tradition began in the mid sixth century with uh, the Emperor Justinian in Constantinople when he commissioned the building of the Hagia Sophia Cathedral. Hagia Sophia means the Cathedral of Holy Wisdom. Um, eventually, by the way, uh, when Constantinople fell under the uh, Ottoman Empire, uh, it was turned into a, a mosque and so that's where these four minarets came from. But what I want you to focus on is the dome itself. As I said, there's a huge dome that sits over the middle of the church. Here's the floor plan. Very complicated looking, but actually very simple in its essentials. First of all, here's the dome with those four feet that connect it to the ground. At either side, there are two half domes so that they make something that almost looks like a racetrack. Okay, that's the nave where the people sit. And then at one end, there was an, another semicircular area that was added, and that's the apse. So if you look at this, you can see two of the three regions that we talked about, the nave and the apse. In addition, in many churches, there were side transepts added on either side of the uh, center, and that gave it the shape of a Greek cross. And so many churches have this shape. In Ethiopia, there are these rock built churches that were carved directly out of the rock. And you can see that they have this perfect shape of a, of a, uh, of a Greek cross. Now, why a dome? Well, if you go back to, again, Old Testament times, you look at the Israelite um, conception of the world, the ancient Hebrews believed that the earth was a solid that sort of sat in the great deep the water, anchored to it by the foundations of the earth, pillars of the earth. And above the earth was a great dome of the heavens, okay, the sky, um, with the stars being little, little, little holes in the sky through which the light of heaven shined. And then above that was God in the heaven of heavens. And there was a little you know, doorway that connected the world to the heavens. And so the dome in a, uh, at a Byzantine church really represents the dome of the heavens kind of covering it over so that everyone inside the church is actually being covered over by the, the dome of the heavens. So every Orthodox church has a dome. This is the Holy, the the Holy Trinity Russian Orthodox Cathedral in Paris. Uh, there are two cathedrals, the older one. This is one that was just finished a few years ago. It was built by the Russian government and the Orthodox church, and it's brand new. It sits in the most expensive, the exclusive area of Paris, right across the uh, river from the Pont d'Alma, the, uh, the uh, bridge where uh, the accident that claimed Princess Diana's life took place. And you can see the domes on top of it, um, the great central dome that we've talked about and then other domes as well. Here's an aerial view that I took from Google, Google Earth. So if you look down at it, you can see, first of all, it's essentially square in shape and there are five domes. <clears throat> the significance of the five domes is that the central dome represents Christ and the four other domes represent the four gospel writers. Now, if we think about the church and the layout, I wanna look at the church as a metaphor for journey. The whole idea of this talk is that a church, the Orthodox church, its construction and its ornamentation are really meant to create what I'm gonna call kind of spiritual ecosphere in which um, something important happens, this transition that takes you to another place and to another time. So here's a rough floor plan of a typical Orthodox church. 
first thing to know is that Orthodox churches and ancient Christian churches in general were typically built on an east-west axis. The uh, main door was in the west, and the, the apse where the altar was was in the east. The reason for this goes back to ancient times. If you go back to Paleolithic days, you know, prehistoric days, um, the things that marked people's lives were the rising and the, and the setting of the sun. You know, when the sun went down at the end of the day, scary things came out looking for something to eat and you were on the menu. And so people hid in their caves, they lit their fires and they waited out the night. But in the morning, when the light of uh, the sun began to rise in the east, they knew they'd made it through the night and they were ready for another day. Over time, this idea of the rising and the setting of the sun meant that the west became associated with darkness and danger and eventually sin and evil and the East represented light and goodness and hope and heaven. And so if you think about it from that perspective, when you went into an Orthodox, well, a church in general, from the main door, from the West, you were symbolically, even if you didn't realize it, turning your back on darkness and sin and moving toward the light. And that's in fact, whoops, wrong way. That's in fact the trajectory of the Christian life. Now, to go back for just a moment, sorry, my, uh, my curse is playing tricks on me. The inside of the church is the area that's accessible to baptized Christians. Outside is where the Gentiles were. So if you were a Gentile, you were not te technically not allowed to enter the church and you had to undergo baptism. In ancient times, in early years, Baptist, a baptism took place outside of the church in a separate building, a baptistry. So it could, before you could get into it and go into the church, you had to be baptized and then you were ready to go in. Baptistries were typically octagonal in shape. And I thought I'd show you a picture. This is a baptistry in Ravenna, Italy. It's called the Neonian Baptistry. And the picture on the right, up on the top, which I took from Google Earth, I'm a big fan of Google Earth, shows you how it's octagonal in shape. And the image down below is part of the mosaic that covered the ceiling. And it shows Jesus being baptized in the Jordan by John the Baptist. Nowadays, most baptistries have actually been moved into the church into a small room off the narthex or even occasionally into the nave. But keep in your mind the idea that the first step in the journey really begins outside the church when you're baptized and then you're allowed to enter into the narthex. The narthex serves as a buffer between the world and the kingdom of the people, the baptized people. The purpose of the narthex was originally to allow those people who were Christians or becoming Christians, but who were not fully members of the church to enter and to listen and hear the services. If you take a look at the left side of this picture, you'll see that we're in the narthex of a church and you can just see the entrance into the nave. This picture on the right is from the Russian cathedral in Paris. And what you might see in the nave are icons with candles in front of them. So people can, who, people can uh, offer uh, prayers for loved ones or whatever. Now, the ceremony of baptism nowadays begins in the narthex. Uh, the priest actually claims the child or the adult for Christ. And there's a, a prayer from the uh, ceremony of baptism that I want to read to you. In your name, O Lord of truth, and in the name of your only begotten Son and of your Holy Spirit, I lay my hand upon your servant who has been found worthy to flee to your holy name and to take refuge under the shelter of your wings. Remove far from them their former delusion and fill them with the faith, hope, and love which are in you, that they may know that you are the only true God with your only begotten Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, and your Holy Spirit. Enable them to walk in your commandments and to fulfill those things which are pleasing to you. For if someone does these things, they will find life in them. They will be inscribed in your book of life and united to the flock of your inheritance. So this is actually an exorcism. In the Western church, the priest will greet the people at the door, who will present usually the infant. The priest will then say, well, what do you ask of this child? And they will say baptism. And then the priest takes his hand and he lays it on the head of the child and says, I claim you for Christ. Okay, you are now under Christ's protection. 
And I'm reminded of this by a story which I think I'll share with you a little bit later. But anyway, uh, in the narthex, that's where the journey now begins. Baptism takes place. Here's a baptistry in a church that's actually built off the narthex. And there are a couple of things to note. First of all, um, baptism can be either infant baptism or adult baptism. And in the Orthodox tradition, it's done by immersion. So in the back, you can see a large basin or tub where an adult might sit and be baptized underneath an icon of Christ being baptized in the Jordan. If the, if the person being baptized is an infant, then they would use a baptismal font. And it's kind of interesting to note that there's a parallel between this baptismal font and this bronze sea in the Israelite, in the Hebrew um, tabernacle, where people used to be purified. Baptism is the place of purification. But if you remember that the bronze sea also represented the journey of the Israelites through the Red Sea to freedom, then the baptismal font also represents that. Okay. St. Paul, in one of his letters, says, we, uh, when you're baptized with Christ, you've died with Christ, then you rise with Christ to new life. Once the child or the adult has been baptized, they're now members of the kingdom of God, in the family of God. And the first thing you need to do with a new baby is you need to feed it. They press it to the mother's breast. And so the person who's newly baptized processes or is carried into, well, I should have said this first. Baptism is done three times by immersion. So here's a baby being immersed. They get dipped into the water, under the water once. I baptize you in the name of the Father, and then of the Son, and then of the Holy Spirit. I remember a priest saying once, um, in the early days with the church, with adults, the priest would hold a person's head down under the water until they were practically out of air, and then let them come up as a reminder that this was really a life-changing experience. It's not nearly so harrowing as that anymore. Once the baby has been baptized, the child is then brought into the uh, nave and they are given communion to feed them on their journey. And then they're confirmed um, to receive the Holy Spirit to help them. In the Western church, these things are done separately, but in the East, they're all done at once. So now let's keep looking at the church as metaphor for journey. So we've now processed from outside into the narthex into the nave where the newly baptized person is. Symbolically, the nave of a church represents the world that we live in, okay? In terms of an old term, it's the church militant, it's the church struggling. Here's a nave from a particularly beautiful Orthodox church. It's the, the um, Albanian Orthodox Church of the Assumption in Worcester. If you ever wanna go see a beautiful church, this is a place to visit. It's almost sensory overload. If you take a look at it, every single surface is covered with icons. Looking down the aisle, you can just make out the front of the church, the iconostasis. But if you look up above, you'll see the edge of a huge dome. That's that dome that protrudes from the roof. And coming down from it, one, two, three, and four are the four pillars that, that, that arch over the church. Around you in this particular church, not only on the ceiling, but on the walls are icons of saints. If you know much about icons, you know that icons of saints typically have a gold background. And the function of the gold background is to remind you that the light of God is shining through that person into the world. But if you're in a space where you're surrounded on all sides and above by icons with their light shining through onto you, what that's telling you is that you're not outside looking in, you are surrounded, which means you are already surrounded by the light of heaven. So that's a reminder that when you walk into a church, you're not simply walking into a building, but you're actually walking into a place where in a metaphorical kind of way, you're actually in heaven. Here's a long view down the aisle. If you look above it, you can see the icon of Christ in majesty, along with a whole bunch of other icons. But what I wanna focus on now is the front of the church as we move down. The first thing you'll notice is that there's always an, a chandelier hanging from the, uh, the dome. And usually it's the most elaborate chandelier that the church can possibly afford. And it, what it means is uh, it's a reminder that the light of God is descending from heaven into the world. Above it, you see the dome. This is a look into the dome in that church. 
and you'll see Christ in majesty in the heavens, obviously, with the stars above him. You'll see some angels, and then you'll see other figures which are a little tough to see in this particular church. So let me switch to a church in Cyprus called uh, Agios Dimitrianos. It's got a really beautiful dome, and it's, it's accessible enough that you can actually see it. <clears throat> so in the center is Christ, Christ the ruler of the universe. He's surrounded like a king by his angelic choir, and then around him by the members of his royal court. At the top right and left and bottom right and left are four figures. These are painted on the pillars that reach through the ground to support the dome. And they're the four evangelists, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Okay. And then underneath Christ, actually arching around him, there are four figures that I want to focus on here and here. Okay. And they are David and Solomon and Peter and Paul. So they are the rest of the heavenly court. Okay. The Old Testament figures who, uh, who believed and were faithful before Christ and the apostles who promulgated his word in the world afterwards. And there's a little uh, image right up here, which is particularly interesting. This is also Jesus. And you can tell it's Jesus because he has a cross in his halo. Okay. Jesus is the only one who ever has a cross in his halo. And he's wearing this stole, which is the mark of a bishop. So it's Jesus as kind of the high priest. And arcing around him and over him is what looks like uh, the great arch from uh, St. Louis. It's actually part of what's called a mandorla. A mandorla is an opening into heaven. And so Christ is in heaven, standing at an altar, offering the sacrifice. And the inscription behind him says divine liturgy. So it's a reminder that when the divine liturgy is being celebrated in the Orthodox Church, it's not the priest who's actually celebrating it, it's Christ who's celebrating it. Now, let's talk about the, uh, the altar area. As I said, here's a close-up of the uh, iconostasis and the altar area. The problem with this is because it was taken from a distance, everything is sort of foreshortened. So it's tough to see what belongs to what. So let's separate them, okay? Here's the iconostasis, okay? What you see is the main door called the royal door. That's the door that the priest goes in and out of during the sacrifice of the, the divine liturgy. It represents the opening into heaven. Again, remember the sanctuary symbolically represents heaven. The nave represents the world. Oops, skip ahead again. On one side, you always see the icon of Christ, and on the other side, the icon of the Mother of God, Mary, because they're the two people responsible for opening that Christ by his death and resurrection, and Mary because she gave him the human body that made the incarnation possible. It's tough to see the door down here, so I'll show you another picture a little bit later. Above the door is an icon of the Last Supper as a reminder that what's happening is a, is a recreation of the Last Supper and the events after that. Next to Christ is an icon of John the Baptist. And on the left-hand side, next to the icon of the Mother of God, is the icon of the Dormition. The Dormition is what in, e in the East is called the Assumption of Mary in the West. And it's, always, it's almost always an icon of the church uh, of the person to whom the church is dedicated. So if you recall, this church is the Church of the Assumption. This is the icon of the Assumption. And then next to them are St. Michael the Archangel and, and Gabriel, the other Archangel. So that's that panel that sort of separates the two. There are also a couple more doors on, the other, on either side of it, and we'll see that a little bit later. If you move beyond that, you get into the altar area, and you'll see the altar, and, and then the back wall, usually with an icon of Mary. And then above it, of course, a dome uh, that, that covers the apse. Here's an iconostasis from St. Julian Le Pauvre in Paris. It's a, a pretty little church directly across the river from Notre Dame Cathedral. It's one of the oldest churches in Paris, and it's a Byzantine church. And you can see the whole, you can see the icons now. Uh, here's the icon of Christ. Here's the icon of the Mother of God. Here is the main door, the so-called royal door, and these doors on the side are called the deacon's doors. We'll talk a little bit more about them a little bit later. 
And then above that, you'll see some additional um, layers, levels, and I'll talk about that in more detail in a couple of seconds. Right now, I want to focus on the royal door. So here's a, uh, an expansion of the royal doors. What you almost always see, first of all, is the icon, the, uh, icon of, the, of the Annunciation. Okay. The Annunciation, if you think of the life of Christ as the drama, it begins with the Annunciation, where Mary uh, ascends to letting Jesus take form in her body. And once that happens, uh, that's the beginning of the process that leads to the opening of those doors. Below them are icons of the four gospel writers. So the Annunciation begins the, the process, the resurrection completes the process of connecting heaven and earth. Now, in Russian churches, these can get to be very, very elaborate. And in huge cathedrals, they can be as many as five layers high. Um, it's impossible to get a good photo of uh, the iconostasis of a church in one of these large churches, unless you have, I guess, a wide angle or a fisheye fish lens. So this is an icon of the iconostasis, and I'm gonna use this as an example. Here's a blow up of it. On the bottom level are what we just talked about, the royal doors, the two deacons' doors, and so on. Above that, there will be icons with episodes from the life of Christ. Above that is a layer called the deesis layer. It's Christ in majesty surrounded by the apostles. Above that is the icon of his, the mother of God seated in majesty with Christ in her lap. And around her are the Old Testament prophets, each one holding a scroll with their prophecy describing the coming of the Messiah. And then if the church is large enough, a final layer with the, old, with the patriarchs of the Old Testament, with uh, David and Joseph and Abraham and so on. If you think about it for a second, if you begin at the top and you kind of work your way to the bottom, what you're doing is, what you're doing is starting with the earliest revelation of God to the, um, uh, the Old Testament figures through the prophecies foretelling the coming of Christ, to the life of Christ and the apostles, to his death and resurrection, culminating with the opening of the doors between heaven and earth. So it's really a kind of retelling of the whole history of salvation as a reminder that people who assemble to celebrate the divine liturgy are the beneficiaries of that. Inside you'll see the sanctuary and you'll see the altar table. And we're not going to talk too much about that, but that's where the priest actually presides during the divine liturgy. Now, we've talked about the decoration and the structure of the church. Let's try to bring it all together and figure out how all of this is tied in with this idea of sacred time and sacred space. First of all, remember, again, the nave represents the world in which we live. Uh, our 40 years of wandering in the desert while we try to figure out what it means to be free, the sanctuary represents heaven. And those two things until the, birth, until the death and resurrection of Christ were separate, blocked off from one another, and they're now opened so heaven and earth are connected with one another. Off to the left-hand side of the altar is a small table. It's called the prothesis or the table of preparation. And this is where the priest prepares before the divine liturgy actually begins. There's a really beautiful ceremony, which I can't describe because it's too long, in which he takes the bread and the, and the wine and prepares them to be offered. When, that, when that's done, and this should be a deacon kind of overseeing the process, watching the church as the people come in and assemble. Once the preparations are done and the deacon is... Um, uh, satisfied that the community has assembled, he turns to the priest and he says, it is now time for the Lord to act. And he's not saying, well, it's time to start because it's 10 o'clock. What he's really saying is the community has assembled. Remember, um, Jesus said, when two or three people are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. So when the community assembles, Christ is now in their midst. And the community is, the community is sitting in the nave, and the priest. And collectively, it's time for them to begin the divine liturgy, but it's the Lord who acts. It's God who acts. So go back to this picture that we saw in Agios Dimitrianos. Christ celebrates the divine liturgy. Remember, 
Um, there's only one sacrifice of Christ. He only died and rose from the dead once. So uh, how, how is it that there can be masses offered in many places? Christ is the one who celebrates the mass, uh, the, um, the divine liturgy. It's celebrated in heaven. Okay. We celebrate the divine liturgy on earth. It takes place in a specific place geographically and at a specific time. But Christ celebrating the divine liturgy in heaven takes place in, um, in eternity where there's no time and where there are no, uh, no physical bounds. And what happens at the divine liturgy in the Byzantine, the Orthodox view, is that heaven and earth become united. So the sacrifice that the, uh, is taking place in the, in the church is actually taken up and united with the sacrifice that's taking place in heaven. Now, second thing is that there's a lot of coming and going in the process of the divine liturgy. Um, first time you see an, uh, an iconostasis and you realize that the priest is actually at the altar behind it, your first thought is, is this like being at a, um, an obstructed seat in the old Boston garden where I can't see anything? But in fact, during the, during the divine liturgy, both the central door and the two deacon's doors are open. And there's a lot of coming and going, processing back and forth. Um, there are actually four things I want to focus on. Just before the gospel, there's something called the little entrance in which the priest, accompanied by the deacon and the servers, processes out of the deacon's door on the left, holding the book of the gospels. He processes down around the bottom of the back of the church, up the main altar and into the uh, altar area, presenting the gospels. It's a symbolic reminder that Christ uh, comes into the world with his word. So the, the word of God is born into the world by Christ. Secondly, when the gospel is read, the priest again comes out and stands on a stair in front of the, uh, in front of the door and reads the gospel and then preaches the homily. Again, a reminder that while it's priest, the priest is doing the physical actions, it's Christ who's actually doing this. And then later, there's a, what's called the great entrance in which the priest again processes out from the deacon's door uh, with the uh, servers and the deacons holding the gifts to be offered. And again, it's a reminder that Christ is not only the one who brings the gift into the world, but he, he himself is the gift that's being offered. And then finally, when the Eucharist, the communion is being distributed, the priest again comes outside and stands out in the front to distribute it. So that it's a reminder that Christ comes into the world to feed his people. So in fact, although there is a kind of what looks like a solid wall, most of the time the priest is actually outside in front um, ministering to, the, to the, uh, the, the people. In the course of the uh, divine liturgy, the people sing a hymn called the Cherubic Hymn or the Angelic Hymn. And the words that they usually sing are, we who mystically represent the cherubim, the angels, who sing to the life-giving Trinity, the thrice holy hymn, the holy, 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 let us lay aside all earthly cares, for we are to receive the King of all, the King of all, invisibly escorted by the angelic host. Alleluia. Now, this is interesting, but in that first line, there's a slight but important mistranslation. The word that usually gets translated, represent, is actually more accurately represented or translated as join with. So we are actually part of the whole process of the, the heavenly choir. Okay, when Christ comes into the world, when Christ comes into the church, he comes into the church accompanied by the angelic host. And so uh, if, if you think of the nave of the church being kind of taken up into heaven, united with heaven at the uh, divine liturgy, all of the angels are there. The saints who are on the walls of the uh, church are also there. And so the congregation becomes part of that massive heavenly host that, that, that uh, offers the sacrifice. Okay, last item. The Christian is an icon of God. You know, we know that the word icon means an image, and it comes from the book of Genesis, where it says God made man, human beings, in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So people who come into the world are icons of God. My wife likes to use an expression about a newborn baby, that they're fresh from the mouth of God, okay? They're pure and fresh. But what happens over time, just like a stained glass window that sits around for centuries, it begins to develop an accretion. All of our kind of weaknesses and sins 
kind of dull that image. And the, ta the task of um, the Christian in the world is to clarify that image. Okay. And the way to do that is to participate in the divine liturgy. That's the whole orthodox idea. When you enter into the church, you bring yourself into that light of Christ. You allow him to work on you. Um, and a good way to describe it is by a woman named Catherine de Doherty in a book called Pustinia. And she says, stand still, as you do in church, allow the strange, deadly restlessness of our tragic age to fall away like the worn out, dusty cloak that it is, a cloak that was once considered beautiful. Think of what I said about uh, standing in the labyrinth at the, for, at, at the edge of Wall Street. When you become absorbed in something, you really do get transported out of time and space. The restlessness, so typically typical of our culture, was considered once the magic carpet to tomorrow, but now in reality, we see what it is. It's a running away from your own self, a turning from that journey from the earth to heaven that all people must undertake to meet God dwelling within the depths of their souls. And so the whole construction of an Orthodox church is done, is done with a view to that, to the idea that it's not simply a symbolic action, but it's something that happens in reality. And that's why when I wrote the description for this talk, I used this quotation from Jane DeVire. As soon as we step into an Orthodox church, we are stepping into another world, another realm. We are stepping out of our ordinary world into the eternal world, and we have the opportunity to experience a foretaste God's heavenly kingdom. And so one last item of business, I would like to spe especially thank my wife, Marjorie, who graciously provided many of the photographs in this presentation, and even more importantly, put up with me and my grumpiness as I put this presentation together, because I'm not easy to live with when I'm doing something like this. So thank you very much for joining us this morning. Thank you for your patience. And if you have any questions, I haven't drummed you into silence. I'll be happy to try to answer them. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dennis. And um, of course, thank you, Marjorie, for all your help uh, with the, helping us practice the presentation and all that good stuff. Um, and I apologize. Um, some people seem to be having um, a little bit of an issue uh, with either video or audio. Um, Zoom has been doing a lot of updates lately, and I think that's causing some technical issues. Um, I know we had a few problems last week as well, so I apologize, but um, the recording will be available on our website and I will email everyone the direct link uh, once that is available. So if you have any questions, feel free to drop them into the Q&A, um, but we do have one question already. Um, this is a good one. So Dennis, uh, why does the Eastern tradition retain the Jewish tradition of a holy of holies, which keeps the people separate from sacred activity, unlike in the Western tradition, which brings us all together where we pray together, uh, even though it's visible. Processions are not the same experience uh, well, sorry, as being present. Okay. Um, it's kind of interesting. In the West, somebody asked a question last week about music. Um, and I said, you know, there are no musical instruments in the Byzantine liturgy. The liturgy that's used in both the Orthodox Church and in the Melkite Church, which is the Catholic counterpart of the Orthodox Church, was written by St. John Chrysostom. And it's a chanted liturgy. The entire thing is chanted by the congregation. So the congregation and the priest chant all of the prayers together. And while it seems, as I said, uh, if you look at the iconostasis as a wall, uh, that it's meant to separate people, a couple of things. Number one, if you remember that the iconostasis is filled with icons of saints, and in an icon, what you're looking at is the saint silhouetted against the light of heaven. Uh, well, let me use a football analogy. Um, in the Western church, you know, most of the uh, altar rails have been removed. And so the, uh, the, the demarcation between the sanctuary and the nave is now equivalent to what's like the um, invisible plane at the, at the uh, goal line of a football game. Well, you know, the rules in a football game are pretty easy. Take the ball run, cross the goal line, spike the ball, do your touchdown dance, and so on. Well, think of the saints on the iconostasis as those spiritual athletes who've done that. They've run the race, they've managed to score despite all of the hazards like the crazed 350-pound uh, uh, linemen who are trying to stop them. Uh, they've they've uh, done their touchdown dance, and they now stand at the windows of heaven. They're not saying staying out, they're saying come in. But the other thing is to remember how much First of all, activity occurs in front of the iconostasis. 
most of the really interesting stuff occurs right in the front of the iconostasis. Um, so viewed in the right light, it's not really um, a secret kind of thing or a, an attempt to distance things. And in fact, um, as I said, to really participate in a divine liturgy in the Orthodox Church, you really have to be fully present and fully uh, participating. So long answer to a short question. <laughs> I know some of these questions, um, I, I can tell you, are separate pro programs in and of themselves. Um, so let's see. Uh, so this person commented, uh, a most wonderful presentation. I'm curious, what is the significance, <laughs> what is the significance of the word scour scourge in relation to baptism, atrium, vestibule, as was written on one of the slides? Oh, I'm glad you picked up on that. Um, what scourge meant is not literally scourging, but... Uh, in the early church, um, first of all, um, the early Christ the earliest Christians believed that Christ was going to be coming back soon, you know, like next week or next month or whatever. And so they were, uh, when you get baptized, all your sins are forgiven. So you have a clean slate. Well, if Christ is coming back in a week, you're okay. But as time went on and it became clear that Christ was not returning tomorrow, the church had to figure out what to do because... Um, Let's say you get baptized when you're 20 years old and you've got 40 more years of life. Um, you're making a bet that you're not going to sin in the next 40 years, which uh, for all of us, most of us, is not, it's not a bad, not a good bet. So what, uh, what people would often do is that they would put off baptism until the absolute last minute, you know, when you were just about ready to expire, figuring, okay, you know, no matter what I've done, they baptize me at the end, the slate is clean. Well, but then what happens is Suppose you have, you've been baptized at some point in your life and you have committed some other sins. What do you do? Well, the church, that's where the church developed the sacrament of penance. But um, oftentimes penance was a public penance. You had to do some kind of thing for a period of time. And so people who had sinned and were doing penance were allowed to enter the narthex where they did that penance and they were cleaned. So scourged really is a kind of a tough word. It really means, really means more like cleansing. It doesn't mean being you know, rubbed with Brillo pads until you shine like uh, marble. It means a cleansing. Great. Um, so let's see. Oh my goodness. Uh, why do the attendees stand in the Orthodox Church? Well, in fact, you know, um, bench, pews and things like that are a relatively recent innovation in church. Now, I'm talking in church time. We're talking over 2,000 years. If you look at more of the, most of the great cathedrals, for example, in, in Europe, they don't have, they might have chairs, but uh, in the early days, everyone just stood and they kind of milled around. And there's a lot of coming and going in an Orthodox uh, service. People might be going up in front to light candles in front of icons uh, or wandering around. Um, but this, this idea of sort of regimentation is, uh, is something that's unusual. Um, it's entered into the Orthodox Church, but if you look at older churches, they don't have pews in them. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, it seems that most churches have very symmetric arrangements and sizes of domes, while some Russian churches' domes are asymmetric and vary in sizes. Is there any significance to the asymmetry? I, the answer to that is I don't know. <laughs> um, I don't know whether, I, I, my suspicion is they may not all be put up at the same time. Um, the only example that I can think of that kind of is relevant to that is not a dome. It's actually Chartres Cathedral in France. Chartres Cathedral, if you go and take a look at it, pictures of it on, uh, on, on Google, what you'll see is it's got two, uh, two spires and they look very different. One was a, one that was built um, in the Gothic times and one that was built, uh, one that was built in the um, late Gothic times and they were built several hundred years apart. And so it's possible, although I don't know this for sure, that in some of these cathedrals, um, domes were added. But that's just a wild guess. Mm -hmm. so that's a good question. It can be a part two of the program <laughs> and follow up. Um, we'll, we'll take two more questions here. Um, who can participate in the divine liturgy service? Anyone baptized in any church or only those in the Orthodox church? Um, that's one of these it depends answers, okay? The hard line is that uh, real, real traditional, I think, conservative Orthodox people believe that you have to be rebaptized. So if you're a Catholic and you become Orthodox, you become you have to get rebaptized. Um, so I was if you had if you were if you were someone who had that 
that perspective, then I think they would say, no, you can't participate. Oh, again, I don't know. Um, more often than not, though, I think it's like a don't ask, don't tell. If you're coming in, you're going to participate. Um, you know, if you're there, you're, you have the right disposition. Let God worry about it. Excellent. Um, so we'll close with this question. Uh, some Byzantine Orthodox churches leave the royal doors open during the divine liturgy, while the Russian tradition is to close the royal doors and any curtains in the iconostasis during the second part of the divine liturgy. Why is there this difference? Again, I'm not, I'm not really certain. Um, the only thing that I can think of, I was thinking about this actually, when we were in Paris and we were in the uh, new Russian Orthodox, Orthodox Cathedral, you know, we were kind of looking around at things and the royal doors were closed. And all of a sudden I could hear singing very faintly uh, coming from the other side of the iconostasis. And it was clear that something was going on. I don't know if it was Vespers or something else, um, but the, um, if my memory of, is correct, when you enter the, the uh, cathedral in Paris, there's no uh, narthex. There's just two, two guards and a metal detector. Um, and so if that's the case, then there's no guarantee that everyone who's in there would be a baptized Christian. Uh, or um, in the early church, for example, if you were a catechumen preparing to be a Christian, you could stay in, uh, in church until uh, just before the consecration, but then you had to leave. You weren't allowed to attend um, the second half of the mass until you were baptized. And so my, my guess, and this is just a wild stab, is that they closed these doors uh, to, in, in the event that someone might be there who's not a, uh, an, uh, an authentically baptized, let's use that word in person. But again, I'm just making this up as I go. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you again, Dennis, for all of your time and research and dedication that went into this uh, presentation. And thank you, everybody, again, for attending today. And uh, be on the lookout for our upcoming programs. Thank you.